so right now, Bitcoin faces some interesting memes, right? Like transactions aren't instant. Um, micropayments don't work. And they really don't work, right? Um, transaction fees on the order of you know, tenth of a cent to several cents, depending on the exchange rate. Um, and you know, Bitcoin doesn't scale, right? Um, especially of a lot of micropayments. It sort of doesn't work, right? One megabyte blocks, well, let's increase them, right? Well, what happens when you increase them, right? Um, you go from seven transactions per second, one megabyte, with about 220 million a year, um, with a seven billion, give or take, population of the world. That's less than one per year, substantially less. Um, so, what does Bitcoin look like with 1 billion transactions per day? Uh, there's 1.6 gigabyte blocks, 87 terabytes per year. You have enough for maybe San Francisco. Um, so, well, you might be like, okay, well, let's just up it even more. Um, then what happens? Then you have some centralization, right? Uh, mining sort of doesn't work. Um, you're just going to have maybe one pool or two pools, and they sort of have an incentive to make bigger and bigger blocks, and it creates more and more centralization. And an individual running Bitcoin at home cannot do a full validation of Bitcoin. So it's not really Bitcoin. It's not really decentralized, and it doesn't really work that well. So how do we, how do we solve that, right? Um, you can dump everything into a SQL database, give everyone your money. <laughs> um, Coinbase does that. Um, but, you know, it's very useful, you know, there's sometimes a need for that. Um, you can put everything into side chains. Um, you can also use payment channels, which is a one-to-one -one connection between another party. So it's sort of like uh, the Starbucks gift card model, where, you know, you always have a single relationship with another entity. Um, these do face some problems. Um, the SQL database model is also implemented as Mt. Gox redeemable codes. So when you give custodial risk to someone, that creates problems. Um, with sidechains, it's a little bit more tricky. Um, it's not primarily a scalability solution. It works really, really cool with things like name coins. You know, you kind of want name coins to use bitcoins instead of having their own currency, and it's it's a really, really promising technology. Um, but sending funds between chains may exacerbate the problem if you want to send funds between them because it's sort of two transactions instead of one now. Um, so for example, there's Bitcoin, there's chain A, chain B. If you have money on chain A and someone else wants to receive money on chain B, you sort of need to bridge them and that may create two transactions instead of one. Um, and with payment channels, you know, if you have some recurring billing, that works. But what if you want to spend someone else? Then you have to make a Bitcoin transaction. Um, what you really want are anyone to anyone payments. And, and that works in Bitcoin, right? When it hits the blockchain, anyone can send to anyone else because you can just set the output to any address. Um, in the SQL database model where you just give them all your money and then they just update entries, in some database, um, you sort of need to give that one person your money. Um, so for example, if you had someone that wanted to receive money in Coinbase, you can send them a Bitcoin transaction, but that's not scalable, so you've got to put all your money in Coinbase and send it to all the other people inside this Coinbase network. So that creates a lot of centralization. Um, for side chains, you need to be on the same side chain or else you'll have that doubling of transactions. Um, inside a payment channel, um, you just need the same relationship. So what we propose is having a payment channel between many parties in a multi-hop hub and spoke, which is conceptually similar to internet routing. And this uses minimally trusted intermediaries in that they cannot take your coins. It does not involve a third-party custodian, um, but it does require a small malleability soft fork. And there have been soft forks in the past, pay to script hash, BIP34 with the Coinbase transactions, 
Um, and you know, we kind of need to fix malleability anyway. Um, if we fix malleability, we can do this. Um, okay. Taj will go into payment channels. OK, so I'll introduce the, the ba sort of basic payment channels, and we'll build off of that. Um, so we actually were sort of looking, like, who came up with the idea of payment channels? It's, it's not a new idea. I can find stuff from like my current and some other people, like 2012. But I don't know exactly who came up with it in the beginning. Um, we may never know. But it's, you know, it's an old idea. Well, old for Bitcoin. Um, it uses multi-sig. And it allows two people or two entities to send transactions to each other rapidly without hitting the blockchain every time. OK, so I'm going to go through the basics of how to create a, you know, this is a two-party payment channel that's unidirectional. So Alice can only send money to Bob through this. So what she does is she sends, she, well, she doesn't send yet. First, she gets a refund before actually committing. There's a multi-sig address with Alice and Bob who both have control over this address. And Alice wants to send one Bitcoin to it. Before she does so, she gets Bob's refund signature. So that at worst, Alice loses her, her coin for 30 days. So Bob essentially creates this 30-day end lock time refund signature, signs it, sends it to Alice. Alice can either sign it herself and keep it that way, or just wait where, where it's half signed and sign it later. Um, but Alice keeps this, this red dotted line on her hard drive. Because she knows, like, OK, at the end of the month, I can get my money back. Worst thing that happens. Uh, and then once she has this, she knows it's safe. She sends the Bitcoin from her just single user address to the Alice and Bob multi-sig address. OK. Then, once it's in this multi-sig address, she can commit to payments to Bob. With no lock time, Alice alone signs and hands this transaction to Bob all out of band. So Alice says, OK, there's one Bitcoin in here. I'm going to give 0.9 of it to me and 0.1 of it to you, Bob. And here's the transaction. I'll sign it and send it to you. It's not a valid transaction, right? Because Bob has not yet signed it. Uh, so Alice cannot push this to the blockchain. All the miners, every node would ignore it and disconnect. Uh, but she can give it to Bob out of band, some other network, and say, here, Bob. And Bob can treat this as a payment, right? Because this is worth 0.1 bitcoins. Bob can now sign this at any time, right? Signed by Alice, signed by Bob, and broadcast to the network. And in so doing, close out the channel. But Bob does not sign and close out the channel. Bob waits, because he knows this, is, this channel is going to be open for the rest of the month. So Bob waits, and then Alice pays him again. Alice says, OK, I'll give 0.8 to me, 0.2 to you, and I'll sign it, hand this transaction and signature to Bob. And Bob essentially overwrites this old one, because this is purely better for Bob than the uh, bottom one. right? This is better. You know, Bob gets 0.2. That's better than 0.1. He can keep it on his hard drive if he wants, but he's never going to broadcast it. He's not going to sign it. This is better. Um, and he can keep doing that. right? So, and then at some point, Bob says, OK, the channel's over. Either Alice can request the channel to be closed out, um, and Bob can cooperate. Or if Bob's a jerk, he can wait until the end of the month and then you know, keep Alice's funds locked up for the whole month and then sign. If Bob waits too long, Alice gets all, all her money back. Uh, so Bob is pretty you know, motivated to sign this at some point in the next month. When Bob signs it, OK, it's signed by both parties. There's no end lock time. It goes to the network. And all the network sees is one Bitcoin from Alice to multisig, and from that multisig to these two addresses. So during that month period, Alice can send as many small microtransactions to Bob as she wants. OK, that's the unidirectional channel. Is everyone mostly? Um, OK, on board with that. So you can actually change the direction of channels after you've created them. Uh, the startup is the exact same. You get a refund from Bob to Alice, signed by Bob. Alice Holt keeps that. Alice pushes the one Bitcoin into the multi-sig multi address. But now when Alice spends to Bob, she does so with a 29-day lock time. So if this refund is valid on the 30th, this spend to Bob is valid on the 29th. And she can start incrementing it the same way keeping the same lock time. Now Bob has uh, 0.2. Do we stay at point? Yeah, Bob has 0.2. And Bob wants to pay Alice back. Um, for whatever reason you want to, you know, Bob says, OK, I actually have, I'm going to pay you now from the money that you were paying me. 
and he can you know, sort of provably commit to a payment to Alice by overwriting this back to the 0.1.9 version. Now it's a 28, so Bob signs it with a 28 day lock time, sends that signature and transaction to Alice. Alice can now broadcast this before Bob can broadcast this. So Bob, you know, isn't getting the 0.2. Bob's getting 0.1 because Alice broadcasts first. So you can change the direction of the channel a number of times, but each time you change the direction, you have to bring the lock time closer to the present. So you can't keep doing it a million times, right? You're going to probably want a, de you know, here we have a day difference. That's probably excessive, but you want a decent some amount of slack in between those two times so there's not really a race condition. And you can start bringing the uh, lock time closer to the present, changing direction. Um, yeah, and to close the bidirectional channel, both sign. They can, oh, they, yeah, they can both sign a new thing with no lock time if they cooperate, or they can sign the uh, lock time one. Okay, so, so then I, I will transition, transition briefly to three party, party payments. payments. I'll show the motivation, and Joseph will say how it actually works. So, what would be really cool is let's say Bob is a big company, or, you know, they, they're, uh, you know, some kind of payment processor, there's some kind of company that a lot Coinbase, of people are paying. BitPay. Coinbase, BitPay, Newegg, I don't know, something people use a lot. And Alice has an existing channel open, Bob has an, or Carol has an existing channel open. Everyone's got a connection to Bob. Alice, though, wants to pay Carol. And Alice could just send the Bitcoin to Carol, but this is in the future where everyone's using Bitcoin and transactions are kind of expensive. So Alice wants to save money, and since these channels are open, it would be really nice if she could send it to Bob, who then sends it to Carol. That way, nothing has to touch the blockchain, and it's free. There's no transaction fee. So, Alice can send 0.01 Bitcoins to Bob, and then Bob can send the 0.01 Bitcoins to Carol. So, this is a micropayment network. There's some trust issues here. Um, Bob might just keep the 0.01 Bitcoin, and he can say, I'll keep this. You also have the problem that Carol can claim she never got the coins, and there's no real way to verify that the payment. Carol's like, no, I got this from, you know, I, Carol can get 0.01 via Bob, but Carol's like, no, that was from Dave. Um, so this doesn't really work. I mean, it might work if you trust Bob, but we're trying to get away from the whole trust thing and eliminate that, and minimize it to the extent possible. Okay, so Joseph will talk about how to actually do this. Yeah, I mean, that model works pretty well in the meantime, though. I think you can mitigate it in other ways using, you know, two of three multi-sig, whatever. There could be elaborate things you could do, but it'd be nice to do this in a trustless way. So what can you do? You can create a hash lock contract. Um, now, hash function is a unidirectional um, cryptographic method whereby you take some input and you get some output that is that cannot be reversed. So you know um, what you do is you do take some random data R and you convert it. You run it through a hash, let's say hash 160 in Bitcoin or whatever, and you use that as sort of a key. Um, and you need the lock, which is the random data R, in order to um, unlock the funds encumbered. And there's a paper in, I believe, 2013 called Pay to Contract. And essentially, um, if Alice has the data R, which, was, which produces uh, H, she can say, I have paid you the money, right? Um, and she does that by the receiver writing some signed message, effectively a contract that says, if Alice knows R, um, which produces H, then at that point, Alice has paid me 0.1 Bitcoin. Um, and that works. Um, and you might ask yourself, well, why don't you just check on the blockchain? But you can't, right? Um, because everything we're discussing here, nearly everything, is off blockchain. Um, so you need some way to prove that funds have been sent. Um, so essentially, um, this right here is what Carol produces. Carol has some random data R. She runs it through a hash function, let's say the Bitcoin hash 160 or whatever, to produce H. She gives H to Alice. 
And now Alice knows H, but she doesn't know R, right? Um, and Carol has both. Alice uses a payment channel payment to Bob, but this is encumbered and can only be released if Bob can produce R. Okay? Different yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Assume the high function yeah. Um, yeah, let's assume it all works. I mean, you know, if this, uh, if if this doesn't work, Bitcoin has some problems. Yeah. 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 Um, Bob does the same with Carol. Um, so what happens is, is Carol has a payment from Bob that is encumbered, and Carol can only pull funds if she gives Bob R or broadcasts R onto the blockchain, right? So what happens is, is Carol says, "I want my money," so she gets, so she tells Bob R. And Car Bob and Carol can broadcast the channel onto the blockchain, or they can just agree to Novate and say, OK, we're, we're good. Um, the, I know you know R. You gave me R. I know you can pull the funds on the blockchain. Let's not pull the funds on the blockchain because that's expensive. Let's just do this inside the channel. And they both agree to do that. If Bob is uncooperative, or Carol's, if Bob is uncooperative, then Carol does broadcast it onto the blockchain. But Bob is nice today. Um, so Bob, now that he knows R, can pull the one bit sent from, from Alice. So Bob, acting as the intermediary right there, is not really in substantial risk, if you look at it this way, right? He can always pull funds from Alice and give it to Carol, right? Possibly? Problem. If Carol refuses to disclose R, she can hold up that funds in the channel, right? Even worse is if Alice's connection with Bob expires before Bob and Carol's, then Bob sort of has already paid Carol, and Alice's and Bob's channel is closed. It's hit the blockchain, right? So Bob can be out of money. That's a problem. The other problem is that Bob sort of has to be really rich, right? <laughs> and this is sort of unintuitive, but Think about it this way. If Alice and Bob has the channel, and Alice committed one Bitcoin, so the ledger is Alice has one Bitcoin, the channel is one Bitcoin, Bob is zero Bitcoin, then, OK, that means that Alice can only send funds. Alice can't receive any more funds because she's sort of full. If everyone gives money to Bob, everyone has full funds. You kind of want Bob to send money out, create channels outside, right? to other people. So for example, if to Bob sends funds to Alice, then that has a channel that can be spent. So then the system sort of works. The availability of funds that Bob has has some implications for fees, but we won't really get into that. Um, it's just Bob just needs to be really rich on a single hub and spoke model. Um, so let's say Bob is rich. Um, how do you mitigate this problem? You, you can do things like third-party multi-sig, where Alice and Bob, this payout, is also has some third-party escrow service or something like that. That can work today. And I think it could work fairly well today. Um, you could also trust that Bob will be honest and send the money um, and not encumber everything. Um, that works too. Uh, but what we really need is to build a trustless model, right? Um, corruptible custodians are undesirable. You kind of want Bob unable to steal funds. Um, but right now with Bitcoin, complex chain transactions, chain transactions don't really work. Um, with malleability, you can create these hostage scenarios. So if funds are locked into a two of two multi-sig and the transaction gets mutated, the refund transaction is not spendable. And with 202 multi-sig, one of the parties can just resign, right? You can't really protect against that that well, especially if the transactions are chained, right? Like two or three deep, like a transaction is spending to another transaction to another transaction. So in order to do that, we need to fix malleability. And yeah. Tad will go into that. Uh, I had a talk about this a month and a half ago or so, 
And this is a, you know, another use case where you basically need some kind of sig hash modification. You could do a totally different signature with a different opcode, or you can just have the sig hash flags. And you could have a sig hash you know, normalized, which uses the normalized TXID, which is just the same calculation as TXID, which with the uh, signatures stripped out from the inputs, or a sig hash no TXID input, where you remove your uh, input TXIDs completely and essentially have malleability on your input side as well as your output side, which is slightly more risky if you are spending to the same address multiple times, but you shouldn't be doing that anyway. Um, so both of these are the no TXID, the no input is a, uh, is a lot more flexible in what it can do, but you sig hash with a normalized TXID also lets a lot of these contracts work. So hopefully we can get both of these sig hash types or something equivalent in functionality into Bitcoin pretty soon. I don't think there's a ton of controversy because, I mean, you have stuff like sig hash none, uh, so why not have these, right? It, it, it's much safer. Um, and then, yeah, I guess there's a link to the paper I talked about a few weeks ago. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. You can. <laughs> okay. So in order to enforce Bob being able to send to Carol and Bob knowing he can receive funds from Alice, you kind of want to build this contract, right? And what would be the terms of this contract? Um, I think, for example, a contract can look like if Bob can produce to Alice some input R, and R being some random data that Carol generates, um, or Bob generates, rather, um, with input R from hash H within three days, Alice will pay Bob 0.01 Bitcoin. Um, however, after three days, the above clause is invalid, meaning within these three days, if you can produce this hash, you will get 0.01 Bitcoin. But after three days, the funds locked inside this output will be refunded. And either party may agree to settle the terms using other methods. Um, so for example, instead of bro broadcasting on a blockchain, they can agree to settle it out inside the channel. Um, and violating the terms will incur a maximum penalty. So for example, if Bob tries to do something sneaky after three days, um, you kind of want Bob to make sure you won't do something like that. So you create a contract um, inside Bitcoin scripting itself using multiple transaction outputs. So there's a single output of 0.01 Bitcoin um, between Alice and Bob. And the payment, which is this, oh, this is sort of point number one. So the payment has no lock time, but requires R. So if this output committed between Alice and Bob, and Bob produces R, he can broadcast on the blockchain a transaction that spends from this output. And Bob would have to broadcast both the output and the spend. However, after three days, Alice has an unencumbered transaction which does not require R, which is a refund of what Alice committed, this 0.01. So what happens is Alice funds the 0.01. Um, Bob doesn't broadcast anything. Alice can broadcast a transaction that gets some money back. Um, if Bob produces something within three days, he can get 0.01 Bitcoin. And this is sort of what the script looks like for the output. Um, spending that is pretty simple. You know, you provide the data, either or. Um, the first one has three items. The second one has two items. Um, so what happens is, is when three days occurs and Bob doesn't produce anything, Alice has the option of going to Bob and say, hey, you didn't produce anything. Let's update the channel to remove this output entirely. And Bob can agree, and that'd be good. If Bob doesn't agree, Alice broadcasts the output and the refund onto the blockchain, right? So what can you really do? Let's say Alice wants to send funds to Dave via Bob and Carol, and Alice discovers Dave through something like you know, BGP or CJBDNS or whatever. Um, but she knows that there is some 
network that Bob and Carol is in. So maybe there's like hundreds of Bob and Carols, right? You got Visa, MasterCard, Amex, yeah. Union Pay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's there's a fair amount, right? M maybe more than today with card processors, but you know, um, there is some route, right? Um, and the blue lines are individual channels between the participants. Um, this will start looking like what it did before. Dave generates an R. She gives H to Alice. Alice creates this contract output. So instead of a standard output, she, she creates this contract between her and Bob, right? It's a hashed, time-locked contract with a three-day lock time. So the funds are locked up for three days. And if Bob can produce R within these three days, then you know, he can pull one bit sent from Alice. But if he can't, Alice sort of gets her money back. Bob does the same with Carol, except this time it's two days. And Carol does the same with Dave, except this time it's one day. Right? And at this point, Dave can pull money from Carol, because Dave knows R, and it's encumbered with knowing R. So Dave pulls R. Dave pulls the money um, using R. And Dave could broadcast it on the blockchain, and Carol could broadcast it on blockchain. But they agreed to just remove the contract from the channel and just send the funds atomically. right? Bob does the same with Carol. Alice does the same with Bob. And at this point, Alice has sent funds to Dave. And no transaction has hit the blockchain. Right? None. Nothing. What happens if Bob just decides not to cooperate with Carol on day two? Right? So it's right here. And instead of doing this, Bob just says, I'm not going to talk to you, Carol, and just ignores him. Right? Carol, knowing R, broadcasts the entire transaction chain onto the Bitcoin blockchain, right? So what happens is the blockchain now knows R because Alice has redeemed the funds. Um, and at this point, Bob has sent money to Carol on the blockchain. And unwillingly. Yeah. Unwillingly, yeah. There's no cooperation. Carol can unilaterally take the money. And reveals R so Bob can now get his money, even yeah, though so he doesn't deserve it. Yeah. <laughs> Bob doesn't deserve his money. He looks on the blockchain and goes, hey, I see this R. I'm going to take my money. But if Bob's not paying attention, then Alice, after three days, can just say, I want my money back. And Alice sort of gets it for free. right? Alice, knowing R in the contract, she technically has paid Dave. Which is why you generally want to broadcast, agree and be cooperative. So what does a timeout look like? Let's say Dave never broadcasts R. Dave just says, I'm going to sit on this and ignore everyone. Then what happens is, is that Dave's and Carol's channel, the output, closes first. And Carol is happy with this setup because she knows that her payment closes out and the knowledge that she will close it out before her money gets pulled. So the nice thing about this is that if Dave discloses R after the fact, Carol's already closed out her channel. She doesn't care. Whether it be inside the channel or on the blockchain, she doesn't care. And right now, like, it closes out, it closes out, and it's OK. Right? And it's as if the transaction has never happened after three days. So what are the implications of this? Um, you can sort of view Bitcoin transactions as circuits instead of packets. <laughs> and only uncooperative channels get broadcast on the blockchain, um, other than expiring, of course. But that means that you really have to look at Bitcoin a little bit differently. Um, if most of the transactions occur off-chain, then Bitcoin's view as a circuit, there's a lot of changes. I don't know. Like, I, don't, I won't go on a long rant about that. But 
um, in any case. Nearly all transactions do occur off-chain securely, and there's near zero risk. The risks primarily relate to not broadcasting in time, and there's race conditions. There's kind ways of to mitigate that. It's in the paper, but effectively, if everyone broadcasts everything on time, then there's no situation where Carol has already paid Dave, but can't pull funds from Bob, right? So it's pretty much near zero trust. Um, it's very different than you know giving custody of your funds to a third party. Um, and creating channels will become very, very infrequent, I think, if you use something like this. Um, so then a question would be, well, you know, these channels are operating between Alice and Bob. They'll eventually expire, right? And then you make a new, cha new channel, and that's like, well, that's sort of a lot of blockchain spam. Um, because you have this trade-off between channel expiry and time risk, time risk yeah. right? Time value of money, fundamentally. Um, you can mitigate that with another soft fork using a relative check lock time verify, whereby the transactions, um, the transaction output outputs yeah. have a relative time lock dependent upon when it enters the blockchain instead of some hard block height. Um, and if you want more information, check out the paper. It's sort of a long way to explain it. And I don't know if it will ever go into Bitcoin. But if it does, it'd be nice, because you can have transactions, uh, channels, rather, that span for years and just never hit the blockchain, right? You leave these channel opens for like five years, 10 years. Who knows? Well, the idea is you, you say it's, it closes next week. Yeah. But then without touching the blockchain, you can no. push that to the next week. You, know, you can roll over with no actual transactions on the blockchain. Yeah, and you do that by creating some commitment for two weeks. And within those two weeks, you sort of have a window to refund all your coins back as a penalty through a signed transaction. Um, so the real implications are instant transactions sort of work now. You can buy a cup of coffee and pay for it instantly and have the funds committed within one second. There's no backseas. The funds are committed. You know, you can't. You can't do this double spend thing, right? Micropayments become really, really scalable. You can send the equivalent of a tenth of a cent. Um, you can pay for things by the megabyte. Uh, you could pay for every single website you visit, pay a, a tenth of a cent. Totally feasible under the system. Nothing hits the blockchain, why not, right? And more importantly, I think Bitcoin can really scale. Um, if you presume that channels won't be used, everyone uses Bitcoin like we do today. If everyone in the world, 7 billion give or take, are making two Bitcoin, two Bitcoin blockchain transactions per day, you're looking at something like, at best, 24 gigabytes. It'll probably be a little bit bigger. Um, the bandwidth use, at best, something like 50 megabits per node connection. Um, if you have channels instead and have this channel network, and you presume everyone sort of has two channels for themselves, except for the core nodes, and anyone can be a core node, um, then those people can make a lot of transactions. They can make nearly infinite transactions inside 133 megabyte blocks, sort of in the optimal view. I think two channels per year, especially if you have um, a relative check lock time verify, is somewhat generous. Most people only have one or two bank accounts. Um, and it's not a bank account because you, know, you don't have custodial risk. But I think two channels per year is a good number to use. And you're looking at something on the order of three megabit per second per node connection, which is very reasonable. But what you might say like, well, 24 gigabytes isn't that bad. <laughs> what happens if everyone's making 20 blockchain transactions per day? Right? Then you're looking at 240 gigabyte blocks. Right? That's every 10 minutes. 240 gigabytes every 10 minutes. That's not practical. 
Um, I think especially if people in the future start using micropayments a lot more, um, I think it's very feasible for everyone in the world to be making 20 transactions per day. Um, I think most people in the West probably do 5 to 10 per day. Um, 20 is not that big of a jump. So you kind of want to solve that. And using this payment network, it's the same, right? If people do more transactions, I mean, unless someone gets really rich or really poor and they need to make a new, new channel, it's the same. So what, what are the storage costs um, under this model? You're looking at something like 7 terabytes per year with nearly unlimited transactions. Um, and that amounts today to about $300 per year in blockchain archival storage. That's only if you want to keep a full record of every single Bitcoin blockchain transaction ever, right? For these 7 billion people, right? Um, so if you want to, let's say, front the $300 per year, be blockchain.info or whatever, it's not that expensive. It's totally feasible. Much more feasible than, you know, 240 gigabyte blocks. And for most people, I think those of us developers, uh, miners, et cetera, are probably going to do the future 0.11, hopefully, um, pruning patch where you keep the most recent blocks. I think two weeks is safe. Add a zero to that, you know, 20 weeks or so. Um, and the full UTXO output set. You're looking at something like two terabytes, right? Which is common in current generation desktops. Um, two to four terabytes is pretty common. Um, and we'll only run you about, what, $100, $150? And you're good forever. Um, for those of us with cell phones, people that want to use Bitcoin, you're looking at several megabytes of storage. Um, the SPV model gets a little bit simpler because you know the transactions that hit the blockchain that are related to you. Like if Alice wants to create a channel with Bob, they sort of both create the channel anyway. Um, so they're only looking for transaction IDs mostly. Um, and they can sort of ignore the old, you know, old data, really. They don't really need to keep track of older outputs and older, older block headers. 